we've got an absolutely stellar um, uh, panel here that um, first up will be Liz, and I'm not going to go through um, the biographies, but she has held um, absolutely key management positions at DOE, the White House, and I believe it was then the Department of Defense. Did I have that? Um, all of which involved numerous responsibilities, but included looking specifically at um, cyber and physical security um, uh, of our grid. We then have Steve Berberick, which I'm sure he is known to many of you, that he is the president and CEO of the California Independent System Operator. He has provided leadership in terms of um, wholesale markets and our transmission planning and system, not just in California, but increasingly in the West, and um, uh, really is an internationally known figure now on how do you run very effective markets that provide reliable and affordable service while also meeting California's um, challenging clean energy goals. And we also want to thank Steve that thanks to he and his team at the CAISO, despite our um, high temperatures this week, we've had um, no significant problems whatsoever. That um, for those of you who don't know about the uh, CAISO app that you can get on your phones, download it, and everybody can ISO look. Today. ISO today. It's one of the best, most accessible ways of keeping track of what's actually going on with electricity grid and our supplies in California. And then last but not least, we have John Wellinghoff, who he and I go back 20 years, I think. Um, and he was chair of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the agency in Washington that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had a bit of a cold and cough this week, um, that oversees our wholesale uh, markets. So FERC does regulate the ISO and the RTOs around the country, but John has had a um, very extensive career, not just at the federal level and understanding and, and being a real mover on what FERC is doing in the electricity grid, but also throughout sort of the whole supply chain, and now is increasingly involved with distributed energy resources and the value that they can provide to our electricity system as they come on. So um, with that, we're going to have about 25 minutes of a discussion up here, and then we'll open it up for um, questions, comments from all of you. So please, as we start in this first part, start thinking about what questions you may want to ask, um, because this is just a, a wonderful and illustrious panel. So I'm going to go sit down. I think I'm mic'd up. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. And um, Liz, let's, let's start with you. Can you just tell us a little bit about, given your role with the federal government, focusing on the Federal Department of Energy, but if you want to talk about the White House or other agencies, um, what is their role in terms of cyber and physical security for the grid? And to the extent you're comfortable talking about this, because some of this is obviously involves highly sensitive information. Um, <clears throat> what do you see as some of the threat streams that we really need to be thinking about? So thank you, Diane and Jim, for hosting this panel discussion on such an important topic for all of us. It's wonderful to be back here. 20 years ago, I came to Stanford after serving in the Clinton administration, <laughs> and this place was actually a little uh, uh, Spanish-style house called the Center for International Security and Arms Control. And next to it was the Stanford Band Shack. <laughs> and uh, it looked quite different. We are now in this beautiful Arriaga Alumni Center, but it's wonderful to be back on the farm. Uh, I'll begin by actually talking about the threats, I think, and then mm -hmm. we're, how we're organized to deal with them. And my colleague, Alice Hill knows a lot about this as well. She'll be on a panel later, later, but she was responsible for resilience policy at the National Security Council and the administration that we just uh, concluded our service <laughs> in. So the threats to the grid are very real, 
and they are full spectrum. So that begins with just natural disasters. Of course, we live in California and we're experienced with uh, natural disasters like earthquakes that can befall us. Uh, they include extreme weather events. Now, some argue that extreme weather is associated with uh, man-made causes, so not uh, entirely a natural disaster but we're looking at some of the effects of extreme weather. So for example, what you have been managing in California with the high temperatures and the consequences of that for, for the grid. We also are looking significantly now at intentional threats because our adversaries have identified the grid, which increasingly uh, is, relies upon the amazing technologies that have been innovated here in Silicon Valley to do so much of what we can do, and that's a big enabler, but it also creates an enormous vulnerability for the grid. And so uh, we see um, the threats uh, to the grid, including uh, intent to disable the <coughs> delivery of power to the American people through cyber attacks. Uh, and of course, we've seen examples of this uh, at home, and we also see deliberate attempts to test capabilities around the world. Uh, if we look, for example, at what happened in Ukraine in the winter of, two, in the winter of 2015 uh, and the uh, Russian effort in, to uh, attack the Ukrainian uh, energy delivery system, which we then, at the Department of Energy, sent a team to evaluate uh, in order to learn, both assist our Ukrainian partners in recovery, but also to learn what were the lessons of that attack for our own systems, and we can come back to that and talk about what we learned and what we did about it. Uh, and then from physical uh, attack as well, where we see examples like Metcalf here in the Bay Area where uh, we have uh, identified an intentional deliberate effort to attack a substation. We see people doing things who don't seem to be associated with a foreign entity and endeavoring to uh, disable us, but rather just crazies who want to go and cut the wires at a substation. Most of our substations, of course, uh, were not uh, located for security reasons. They were put where the power needed to be delivered, but we weren't really thinking it in that era when they were built about the need to protect them from the vulnerabilities that we now face, so across the board. But I want to emphasize that in the more recent period, what we do see is deliberate adversarial endeavors to identify how our grid could be disabled. And uh, so we have to prepare now for that kind of wide-scale potential attack on our grid, not in a uh, limited scenario, but one that could potentially be about disabling the nation. Um, the government is organized to respond to this uh, by sector. So the Department of Energy, for example, where I served most recently was the uh, agency designated as responsible for the energy sector. But when you and I talked in advance of this, uh, Diane, you asked me about what kind of authorities we have, and there I would say that authorities to compel action have not kept up with the threats. And so we really have a mismatch right now uh, between the authorities that exist uh, for the federal uh, agencies and the responsibilities that we have been given. So. We have to work with the private sector principally on a voluntary basis to motivate action. Uh, that is, for example, if you think about the requirement to enhance the cybersecurity of the grid. While there are some actions that have been taken by Congress recently, for example, the FAST Act uh, in 2016, that doesn't really give us the capacity to compel the kind of investment for the future that is going to be necessary to build a strong and resilient grid that can both deter threats and then respond to them effectively and quickly when they occur. So there's a lot of work to be done going forward in the uh, partnership that needs to uh, take place between the federal government and the private sector because, of course, most of you know this, more than 90% of that energy infrastructure uh, that could be uh, disabled by an adversary seeking to impede the American way of life is in private hands. So the only way to make this happen is to get the investment uh, made in the private sector uh, to create that kind of resiliency. <laughs> We're going to move on, but um, again, when you and I talked beforehand, 
I was very um, intrigued by what you said of some of the specific activities that you had to really um, engage with the private yeah. sector. Maybe you could give us um, a little bit of the details about certainly who did you reach out to and um, what were the act, um, <clears throat> actions that you really focused on working with the private so sector? So this is a really important point because it sounds so dire to hear about the range of threats that we face and how serious they are. There's a lot that is underway that is very promising. So I'll, I'll describe three dimensions of the work that we did to address these growing threats to our energy infrastructure. Um, the first is to invest in innovation. And that, here we have Lynn Orr also sitting at the front table, our former Undersecretary of Science and Energy, longtime Stanford faculty member. We were driving innovation in this space through something called the Grid Modernization Initiative. And it covered a full spectrum also of investments in innovation, uh, which involved thinking about how to build a grid that works that could incorporate the new sources, the renewables, the variable uh, intermittent sources of supply, and all of the other dimensions of a modernized energy infrastructure for our country, all the way to this space of thinking about security. How do we actually create a modern and secure grid a kind, uh, uh, in the face of the threats that, that uh, exist and are growing? Our national laboratories in the Department of Energy were tip of the spear for this work, partnering with universities like Stanford and the private sector. So it's at that point, a lot of the innovation taking place in the labs, then in the partnership with the private sector, we develop and deploy those technologies. We are able to test those technologies in real world situations and explore whether they're working, whether they're effective, effective and what we need to do to improve upon them. So the partnership with the private sector is the second piece, the innovation in labs and in universities, the partnership with the private sector to build systems of response so that we're capable as a nation of responding in the face of these threats. And there the principal vehicle for the energy sector is something called the Electricity Sector Coordinating Council, which is a partnership between the federal government led by DOE and the Department of Homeland Security and major utilities around the United States, uh, the investor-owned utilities, trade associations, public power, uh, rural power, cooperatives, coming together to think through how we can respond in the face of these threats. We decided to secure security clearances for a number of the CEOs of the major utilities around the United States because I wanted to be able to brief them on the threats that we were seeing. So back to the Ukraine example, after we came, the, our team came back from Ukraine with the analysis, I brought in these CEOs and we briefed them on what we learned from the Ukraine attack because that was actionable intelligence for them to take back to their companies and think about what they needed to do. So we had a process in place which we have handed over to the new administration of three meetings a year with the CEOs of the major utilities and the others I mentioned. And we had a very aggressive agenda for action together to try to increase our resilience and response capabilities. And that leads to the third dimension of our work, which was to exercise intensively. You noted I had a national security background, and one of the most important dimensions of that national security background was the exposure I had to the imperative to exercise. We know this in our personal lives, actually. You're stronger if you exercise. We could see from our exercise uh, work in a variety of arenas that what you identify in, through exercises is your vulnerabilities. You see what isn't working. You see where you haven't anticipated what you need to do. And that enables you to get stronger before an attack rather than in the midst of one. So we initiated a very robust exercise series with industry. And I want to note it was cross-sectoral. So it wasn't just the energy sector. It involved the oil, and, the, just the utility sector. It involved the oil and gas sector which is a critical dimension of this ability for us to be resilient and responsive. It involved the communication sector, the financial sector, because of course all of these sectors are interdependent and we have to anticipate what would happen if you're in a situation of a major attack. You're reliant, for example, on communication systems that may not be working. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna be responsive? What are the alternatives to that? 
So the exercise series was significantly uh, accelerated and expanded. Alice can also speak to this. And it's something that needs to be sustained uh, over time to ensure that we continue to prepare against the threats that are emerging and uh, that we need to uh, anticipate and be prepared to respond to. One very quick follow-up, mm -hmm. and then we want to move to Steve and talking about the role of the ISOs and RTOs. Um, have you had a chance to look at the new administration's proposed budget, and are the activities yeah. that you're talking about still funded, or do we stand any risk of potentially losing some funding? So, of course, I've looked at the new administration's new budget, and I'll say that on the cyber front, uh, they uh, appear to be committed to sustaining the level of effort that we were interested in supporting. Um, now, there are, and they have issued a new executive order on cybersecurity as well, which uh, builds on the work that was done and handed off to the new team. So it carries forward a lot of the recommendations that we had made toward the end of the administration. However, the entity within the Department of Energy that's responsible for this work is facing, if the president's budget were to be agreed to, a nearly 50% cut in its funding. And that would be quite draconian because that's the uh, entity, for example, that supports the exercise series. So it is my uh, guesstimate that there will be uh, a number of areas in which the president's budget will be met by significant congressional resistance. We've seen this just in the testimony of Energy Secretary Perry in the last couple of days. So there's a possibility that that will not be the ultimate outcome. But I think looking at this from the perspective of what do we need to invest in for the future, uh, some of the cuts also to the science and energy budget could be quite consequential if it affects the investments in innovation that need to be made in our national lab so that 10 years from now, we have the solutions that need to be engineered into that next generation of the grid. Thank you. Um, Steve, if we could um, now turn to you and um, talk about from the perspective of one of the leading ISOs in the country, how you think about this whole area of physical and cyber security. Um, but if I could ask you, um, as a preliminary item for our audience who may not be as familiar with what is an ISO, maybe to explain to us ISOs, I've used the term RTOs, yeah. so that we understand how it fits into the larger framework. Right. All right, I'll take the first I didn't tell first. you I was going to start anyway, off with that. No, one. that's okay. I've answered this question on, on numerous occasions. But anyway, so uh, many of you don't know that there's in California and much of the U.S., probably about 70% of the U.S. is covered by a, a uh, regional transmission organization or an independent <laughs> system operator. And there's a lot of history of why they've come to be. But essentially, the independent system operator, there's only one in the West, which is a longer conversation, and that's here in California. We're responsible for open access to the transmission system so that anyone can use it and transact it over it. Uh, we're responsible for the reliability of the system, balancing, making sure the transmission system is not overloaded, all of those things. So we're essentially responsible for operating the high voltage transmission system. This is the big stuff, 230,000 volts, 500,000 volts, the stuff that goes to your house. Call your utility if you have a problem with it. Um, <laughs> That's not what we do. But we also operate the energy markets. Um, and the energy markets in California, we run about $9 billion a year through the ISO. And this allows people to exchange surplus power and buy it. And we're effectively kind of the New York Stock Exchange for power as people want to transact on that. Now, part of what I just described, though, really gets to the heart of what we're talking about here. We actually balance the system every four seconds. So as everyone is turning on and off their power and doing all these things, you move the system around and we have to maintain a stable frequency. If you ever look at the back of your electrical devices, you'll see a 60HZ. That's the, the Western Hemisphere power. I think it's the whole Western Hemisphere, certainly North America, is uh, 60 hertz. We have to maintain that. And important for us is we have significant telemetry off of generators, off of substations, off of the transmission system, and information flow that comes into us so that we can balance the system every four seconds. Imagine the vulnerability of a system like that. And that's really what we're talking about today. So this is an important 
critical topic for us. Um, Liz talked a lot about some of the standards that have been set and some of the institutional processes that are in place. We participate in all of those. I have a security clearance, like you talked about, Liz, and get briefed on these various and sundry things um, because it is so important. But I'll talk about the vulnerabilities. I won't talk to you about what we do about them. Um, but I will tell you that we get scanned constantly. We get pinged constantly. Most of the activity comes from China, Russia, and Africa. Now, that shouldn't tell you anything about Africa because it's easy for China to route it through Africa anyway. So, But nonetheless, that's where we see the traffic, and it's a constant problem. So we manage how well we're protected, and we have defenses in depth. And like I said, I'm not going to get into the defenses in depth. But I also want to talk about two other threats. I'll talk about the physical in just a second. The biggest threat remains the insider threat. And the biggest issue there is phishing. And I'll talk about that in a second. And not with an F. <laughs> it's phishing with a PH. You all get them. This is, you know, Sammy from Sudan, and you've got $4 million coming your way if you'll click on this and give me your account information so that I send it to you. Well, they send it to us, too. As a matter of fact, as the CEO of an ISO, they apparently know who I am, and they send them to me. But they're very real. They look like they've come from our employees, and they will send our employees emails from me, asking them for their password information or other information. This phishing threat and this vulnerability, this is how they got the hack into the Democratic National Committee. This is how they hacked into Sony, through phishing. So while we worry about this external probing and all those things, that's my number one worry, that one of our employees will give their credentials over to someone and they'll have the keys to the kingdom. I will tell you what we're doing about that. We have an extensive program where we train and test our employees every month or every couple of weeks, some periodicity. We send out tests to them and they become increasingly difficult. And it's not that we tell our employees that you must be careful about clicking on these things. If you click on one of these things, we have an increasing disciplinary process, including suspension. It's that big of a deal that we know what these emails are. And they clearly are marked as external. They clearly, there are all kinds of clues when you get these emails about what they are. We want them to take a minute and assess that because that is our biggest vulnerability. So that's kind of what we, we work toward on that. Um, we are looking at all kinds of additional techniques way beyond the requirements of this. We operate a grid from Silicon Valley to the border to really much of the West the ports, the heartbeat of our economy, we know we have to be secure, and it has to be more than requirements. We're looking at how to better secure this telemetry infrastructure as well. So let me talk about the physical uh, threat for just a moment. Um, I think, Liz, you talked about this MedCAF incident. Many people don't know. MedCAF is a substation largely serving Silicon Valley where there was an incident with multiple shooters that, that in the middle of the night shot up a substation. And they were very deliberate at what they did. Um, and they seemingly knew what they were doing. And John may uh, talk a bit about that, because he was quite in the uh, midst of this whole thing. That <laughs> issue, too, is something that we have to come to, to uh, terms with. Because I could sit up here and, and tell you in five minutes how to take out the grid. It's not that hard. Um, I'm not going to do it. Minute, um, but. But the point being, if you know where the vulnerabilities are, which I won't tell you, um, but you can do this. And that's my point is those vulnerabilities must be secured from a physical perspective as well. There are new requirements at hardening substations as a result of this. The industry is in the process of doing that, and I'm sure that will, that will continue. But in addition to that, I will tell you, the electric system in California, yes, we have a high level of renewables, but we also have a lot of gas generation. And the gas system is a vulnerability as well. You take out the gas system, you take out the electric system. So the vulnerabilities through our entire value chain are important to us as well. 
So I'll leave it at that. We'll turn it over to John. I'm sure this will give an opportunity to have lots of conversation. Yes. So John, um, <laughs> we've alluded to um, the Metcalf incident, and John was actually the chair of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, as I recall when this happened. That's correct. And I remember that I was back in D.C. and we were having dinner, <laughs> and you said, you're not going to believe this, of sort of, here is a major, major um, item we need to think about, and I think you may have been one of the first people to say this really needs to have a much better focus than we're currently giving. So if you can talk about, you know, overall your experiences, your views, but I'm sure people um, would love to hear firsthand, you know, your um, uh, involvement or your thoughts on the Metcalf incident. Uh, actually, I could do Metcalf, Diane. It's a, it's a, that's an hour presentation, and I won't do that. But I want to thank you for having me here and Jim for having me here. I really appreciate being here. I got some quick slides. Let's see if we can go through them here, uh, some of which touch on Metcalf. But what are the top five threats to the power grid today? Um, you know, and all these that I, I'm going to outline really relate to physical security because I think, uh, or physical issues, uh, because, you know, the cyber one is somewhat theoretical still. Uh, in 2016, there were no uh, successful cyber attacks on the grid in the U.S. There were 214 NERC alerts uh, that came out in um, um, 2016 on cyber. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the Internet of Things, only one of those related to the Internet of Things, of the 214. I just, I just finished reading the, the NERC uh, State of Reliability 2016. That report just came out, I think, today, and I was reading it this morning. So, um, you know, one of the threats is this guy here. Um, this is uh, me with a uh, um, 107A uh, Barrett 50 caliber um, um, semi-automatic <coughs> sniper rifle. And uh, that rifle at 2,000 yards can penetrate through a 5 inch inch steel case of a transformer, a 500 kVA transformer. And that is a huge issue, an issue that uh, happened at, at Medcalf. Here is the, uh, a, a freeze frame of the video at Medcalf of the actual um, attackers firing through the chain link fence, which existed at Medcalf at the time in April of 2006, uh, 2013, was nothing but a chain link fence around the entire facility. They now have a block wall, they now have a lot of other security that I won't go into, that came about as a result of some uh, standards that were put in place that were, um, prom uh, that were actually drafted by NERC. NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which is a standards drafting body primarily of the industry that FERC is designated as a standards drafting body. And once they draft those standards, those standards then are put in place by FERC, by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, they were actually put in place after I left, uh, several years after I left. They should have, should have been put in place very quickly. But ultimately, those standards result, resulted in some of these upgrades uh, to these substations. But, you know, uh, the technology advances. So... <laughs> Ultimately, you know, uh, if you can't shoot through the wall, well, there's other things you can do, unfortunately. And so, you know, people, people who want to do harm to us think about these things and think about things to do. But there's also what they call misoperation. Here's, here's a misoperation. Here's a substation I drove by in Reno with the gate that was entirely open and nobody was there. And, right. I, and I'm going, <laughs> what is going on here? You know, obviously somebody made a huge error because anybody could drive into the substation and do complete damage, could destroy the entire thing, and, and nobody would know any difference. And so, you know, misoperations. I will say, John, though, I, I would add, if anyone's considering this, um, going in those substations and touching those lines is really hazardous. Yeah, 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 you don't, you don't want to be doing that. No, absolutely, you don't want to do that, although there are people who try to do that just to steal the copper, and, right. and, and yeah. some of them don't succeed. Uh, because of exactly what Steve is saying, but yeah, no, you don't want to go in there. And you know, and I notified the uh, the the utility when I when I saw this, but uh, this was after I think I left FERC. But it was an amazing thing to see this this gate wide open and nobody there. Um, you know, other things though are are weather events. I mean, we see you know extreme weather events in this country, and they do have uh, not only you know the ice storms that we have in the Midwest, but you know Steve's uh, system unfortunately is is subject to the wildfires and. California, and unfortunately, Steve has some 
great telemetry to be able to, to you know, visually see what's going on in real time and be able to try to address it. And they've done some great things uh, for resilience and reliability uh, to, to improve the system overall. Uh, you know, but th this is actually one of the biggest threats to the grid right here. This guy here, um, <laughs> at, at, at the distribution level at least, at the, where yes. most people care about, most of the distribution outages in this country are caused by squirrels. So we've got to be careful of this guy. But I'll, I'll tell you, again, cyber threats don't seem to me to be a major one. And I apologize for this slide. I pulled this off a um, news article, actually a trade article, but it supposedly came from NERC. And this slide is probably something nobody can see out there. But what it, what it does is it, it shows that ultimately that there are a number of vulnerabilities and risk levels to the grid, and one of the ones that the NERC's indicating at a fairly high level is our variable resources on the grid. And I would, I would disagree with that one. I think people like Steve and other grid operators are doing a very <coughs> good job of ultimately um, addressing the issues of the increasing amount of variable wind, variable solar that's coming into the grid uh, on the bulk power system side, and also the distributed energy resources, rooftop solar, et cetera, that's coming in on the, on the customer side. Uh, I, I, think, I think we have uh, the tools available and necessary to, and to continue to make the grid reliable from that perspective. So that's not, I don't see that as one of the big threats. NERC actually puts physical on this, this heat map of, of, uh, of uh, threats to the grid is fair, fairly low, relatively low. Uh, to other things like cyber, I, I, I would disagree there as well. I think uh, the physical threat, and as, as Steve says, you know, he and I could tell you how to take out the grid very quickly, but, but if we told you, we'd, we'd have to kill you. Um, it, 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 it can be done, and, and it can be done on the physical side. I don't, you, I don't think you could take out the whole grid on the cyber side. I don't believe you can do that. You can do what you could do in, in Ukraine, and ultimately the Ukraine incident, and I know Liz knows a lot more about that probably than I do, but the Ukraine incident was, you know, was one that was, was serious for them, but it was not persistent. It, it, they were able to bring it back up in a, in a matter of days, I think, or, or less. And I think we could do that here to that. And we have so many different nodes into the grid um, that, yes, you can you know, may, maybe take out you know, this operator here, or you could take out that generator here, ultimately, but taking out the, the grid on a widespread spread basis is not, uh, I think, uh, feasible uh, with a cyber attack the way you ultimately could take it out with a coordinated physical attack. So I worry much more about the physical side of things than I do about the cyber si side of things. And I'm very happy that uh, FERC uh, enacted uh, the SIP uh, Critical Infra Infrastructure Protection Rules 14-2, uh, which are the physical rules that are required. Uh, and, and FERC, and, and you know, Liz talked about, you know, DOE and Homeland only have this ability to kind of, you know, uh, um, work voluntarily in essence and, and, and request that these um, uh, private actors who own most of the grid do something. FERC does have the authority to require them to do things, but it is under the, the rubric of reliability. It's not the ru under the rubric of, uh, of, of, uh, of terrorist threats. And, uh, and we can't, FERC can't require them to do something with respect to immediate threat or vulnerability. Still, nobody can require, for example, PG&E, if I knew tomorrow that there was gonna be a, a, a huge terrorist threat, I couldn't make them do anything as, as the chairman of FERC when I was the chairman of FERC. Homeland couldn't make them do anything. DOE couldn't make them do anything. But ultimately, you know, you'd, you'd have to call them up and say, you know, fellas, we think, ladies and gentlemen, we think th this is gonna happen to your grid uh, tomorrow because of, of the information we have, but there's nothing that, that, that any federal government agency could actually force them to do. So <coughs> maybe you want to comment on yeah. um, some of the things that you've just actually, heard. There, it's untested as of yet, but in the FAST Act of 2016, there are authorities now that require, that in which if the president declared a grid emergency, the DOE secretary would have some ability to uh, require industry to act, but it is, it is ill-defined, mm -hmm. as yet undefined, frankly. Mm -hmm. But there is, a, an imp, there, there is some uh, evidence of interest in, in working through some of what you've just described. I would like to 
talk about this issue of there not being a significant cyber threat. I think there is some, a way of thinking about this that may allow us to stand on common ground here, which is that what I was describing was, uh, if you're talking about a grand scale attack, a nationwide attack, uh, a low probability but high consequence attack is how I would mm -hmm. describe it. That is, right now, uh, we are seeing individual enterprises under cyber attack. It's not on a national scale happening simultaneously, but there is a lot of it going on. So what we have to prepare for is the possibility of a deliberate wide-scale attack that could very well be a combined physical and cyber attack. And actually, because of that concern about the, com the combined effects of a physical and cyber attack, we exercised with industry to that scenario last year. This is what uh, the GridX series is about. And the purpose of that was to consider what would happen if both of those tools were deployed simultaneously on a wide scale to disable our nation. And so I think what we need to consider is the, the possibility that there could be uh, smaller scale incidents, which would not be disabling of the nation, although it could affect a significant population. And uh, those we prepare for in, in uh, work that depends principally on the utility provider in the region, and a nationwide event which would involve a whole of government response. Um, we're going to be turning to questions from all of you in a minute, but let me ask Steve first if you wanted to add anything more. I worry a hell of a lot about the cyber threat. Um, I, you know, I think what a, a lot of what John said is true. Um, a lot of the, you know, people talk about hacking into a smart meter and getting into the system, doing all that. I don't worry about that. I worry about false telemetry. I worry about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. blinding us to where the system goes because I can conjure up a scenario where um, we think the system's doing this, but it's actually doing this. And if we were to compensate for that um, with the direction the information was telling us, we would rapidly crash the grid and it would be a wide scale event. It would be, if, if uh, the ISO took the grid, that would certainly take down California, probably most of the West with us, would be my guess. It would be big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So may I just add yeah. one additional point on this? So the Ukraine attack is very interesting from, as we diagnosed it. The reason that the Ukrainians were able to recover so quickly is because they do not have advanced technology integrated into their system to the degree that we do. So they could revert very quickly to analog systems. And one of the lessons learned from <coughs> that attack for our providers is to consider whether you actually want to have a backup system that is not digital. How could you respond in a situation in which your digital systems are disabled? Could you revert? Do you have them because they're legacy systems still in place? So for example, our Western Area Power Administration, which is a federal entity, uh, still has many of those systems. Right. Uh, but more advanced uh, private sector entities that have deployed technology to a greater degree may not. And so the Ukraine attack, I think, is a very, uh, it's instructive in a small sense, but it really doesn't go to the heart of what we would face on a grand scale. I, I agree with that, Liz. And we actually, I hope this will hearten you a bit, we actually do have um, <clears throat> alternate information sources uh -huh. for this very reason, uh -huh. uh, to make sure that if it looks like this and that doesn't make any sense, we have other, uh, uh -huh. we have implemented other things. And the other thing I will say um, as part of this conversation, and, and not to be um, too overwrought. In my opinion, this is not an if, this is a when uh, scenario. And in addition to prevention, we're also spending a whole lot of time on what do you do to recover? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're gonna make sure we have that covered too, because there are ways to recover without these digital systems, and yes. uh, we would work those, so I'll leave it at that. And, and Diane, I just want to say, I mean, I didn't want to in any way belittle the threat, the cyber threat. I mean, it's a real threat. But I think we do have, you know, sophisticated technologies to deal with it because <laughs> thousands of these things do ping in every day to every one of 
of our utilities. They're, I mean, you can see the maps of where they're coming in, and as Steve knows, they, what countries they come in from, et cetera. But they, de they definitely have you know, the, the technologies to deal with. I just saw Cisco Systems just uh, uh, announce something the other day where they actually can detect malware in an encrypted uh, packet now without having to decrypt uh, 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 de the, the, the packet ultimately. And, uh, and so it's, you know, advances are happening every day there. I don't think we, we're making those advances on the physical side, number one. Number two, on the cyber side, again, the recovery, I think, is one that we can do either through having, you know, analog or alternative data sources and to be able to recover in a fairly reasonable period of hours or, if not hours, days. Whereas, if, you know, if you destroy something, if you destroy substations, uh, and ultimately, it is substations that, that, that would be the, the targets uh, as opposed to generators, then, you know, the persistence of that outage is going to be, you know, months, if not years. And especially if you faced a situation in which there was an intentional attack on multiple transformers sim simultaneously, yes, exactly. which, take, which have this long lead yeah. time, I, maybe I 18 months. I completely agree with that. This is very specialized equipment. You take it out, it takes a yeah. long time to get and, it. And, and this has been widely reported national... Uh, Academy of Sciences has done reports on this. This goes back and back and back. It's not something that I just came up with. When I was at FERC, I mean, I researched it back, you know, at least a dozen years and still nothing had been done until FERC, uh, FERC finally put in uh, the SIP 14.2 uh, standards. Let me, um, real quickly before we go to questions, just ask one thing that there was a um, front page story with the San Francisco Chronicle this week in which it talked about the cybersecurity threat, not in terms of the larger grid, but in terms of individual homes and to some extent businesses with the internet of things and smart devices coming in, that essentially within homes you could create a microgrid and it raised the specter of literally um, locking people out of their houses, locking them out of their refrigerators uh, with food and um, not again on the larger scale, but on an individual basis of the ransomware that you will not get access um, without you know, paying a certain amount. And I'm wondering if any of you, you know, is this something um, that we should be concerned about? Is it something within the purview of the activities that it, are any of you up to? We should be concerned, but it's easy to fix. A 12-year-old can hack into most people's homes. Um, their, their wireless networks are not well secured. Um, and once you get into the network, you can get into your Nest thermostats and assuming you have an automatic locking refrigerator. I don't have one of those. I know. But, um, that might be a good thing. You could, uh, <laughs> you could yeah. get into that. So yeah, I mean, I don't think, I, certainly homes are very vulnerable. Home networks are very vulnerable. Now, does, the that, does, that create a, does that create a wide scale of vulnerability? I don't think so. Any comments from either yeah. of you? You yeah, know, I, I would agree, I would agree with Steve that it certainly uh, it's a uh, threat to us individually that we need to concern ourselves with, and and certainly the more devices. I, my son, who's who's a, a computer geek, he's uh, 26 and a computer programmer. He was uh, setting up new Google routers in our house, and we have 30 connected devices in our house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no idea until he said, "Yeah, Dad, I had to." Had to reprogram the thermostat and reprogram this and do that and everything had to be, you know, to the new routers. And I'm going. Oh my God. And I think the the issue that I worry about is that we know that these ubiquitous devices are actually threat vectors. So a cell phone can be the way into a network that could lead to the disabling of SCADA systems right. that would affect a wide right. population. Right. Right. So. The individual, at the individual level, we would worry there could be risk to a family or liability yeah. in an enterprise, but really the challenge is how do you secure this, this broad network? And, and if you get into SCADA system, somebody help me with, I ne can never remember what SCADA stands for, but... Supervisory control. control. Uh, data acquisition. Data acquisition. data acquisition. So basically, yes. these are the control systems for industrial systems and for things like, you know, generators and, mm -hmm. and pumps and valves and all these kinds of things. The, those, if you get into a SCADA system, you can then, it's been demonstrated that you can physically destroy a generator by getting into a SCADA system. There's a, there was a, 
a uh, that they called the Aurora. Yeah, it was in Idaho. Or yeah, the, the Idaho National Labs did a test on a three megawatt generator where they had a guy hacking in on a, on a laptop into the SCADA system in the generator and pulsed the thing back and forth and tore the whole generator up, yeah. just completely destroyed so, so, the generator. So, you know, you, you can, in fact, go from the cyber to the physical uh, if you know what you're doing. So this is a unique asset we have. I mean, as a nation, we should feel proud of what we have available to us to work on these challenges. At Idaho, we have a grid-scale test bed where we test just as you described and are working to innovate to figure out how to develop the solutions that can be engineered in to the next generation of infrastructure. Yeah, and Stuxnet, in essence, was a virus that went from the cyber to the physical, you know, by destroying centrifuges, by, you know, pulsing them in ways that ultimately destroyed them. So. Um, well, we obviously could just among ourselves keep talking, but I'd like to open this up um, for questions, comments from the audience, and we've got our microphones going around, so I think we have somebody in the back. I think this gentleman. And has yes, been. and please do identify yourself and if you're with an organization. <clears throat> we can't hear we you. A, yeah, wait mic. till you, you got um, a mic get coming your to you right mic. There. The next, I'll tell you what we'll do is the next person will let, um, why yeah. don't you just bring it over so that we can seamlessly move, move through the questions. First, got it. Is this on? Yes. Um, I'm Alan Sandstead uh, with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, I want to pick up on where the conversation is going right at the end about uh, responding to the threats. So grid resilience has been the topic of the day for quite a, for a while now. Enormous amount of work has been done and is ongoing on the question of how do you, how it is one uh, enhance grid resilience. What I'm interested in is how much is not known about what needs to be done at this point? Um, I'm, I'm, my question is, what is the balance between the need for more information as opposed to the need for resources and action? If that question makes okay. sense. How much is not known well, I want, about I want what to needs know, to be done? So there's not, a lot, not known as in the As in what, what to do uh -huh. to, to uh, enhance the resilience uh, of the grid. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's an economic question yeah. um, because you could do we it. know what to do. And a good example of this, um, you know, John was talking about we could we could have a bunch of 500 right. kV trans, uh, uh, transformers uh, sitting around, but they're really expensive. Right. And how many of them do you have, and where do you put them? So I think it's it's a matter of how much do we want to spend on resiliency. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's yes, I think it's it's like you know. 10% we don't know, and 90% 90, 90 it's just a matter of resources. Although, you know, it, it is always, once we put those resources in place, then it's the bad guys figuring out the next step, you know, and you always don't know what they're going to figure out is the next step. But, you know, that's one solution. The other solution on this grid issue is just break the grid up into region, regions. We, we, in fact, did the analysis at FERC and did the load flows to show if you broke the grid up into, like, 12 different, different sub-regions that were all connected with, with DC ring buses, then you couldn't, bring the whole, you couldn't bring a whole interconnect down. But right now, the way the interconnects are set up, the, the three interconnects, there's, there's the western interconnect, the eastern interconnect, and Texas. Texas is its own you know, country. Um, ultimately, you know, those three interconnects could be brought down fairly easily, but if you broke them up into sub-regions with DC ring buses, uh, separating them, you can't do that anymore. Each one of those will stand up individually. So again, it's, that's a matter of economics of whether you want to go there, whether you want to do that or not. And, th and that would protect it both from a cyber and a, and a physical pers perspective because you could, you could separate you know, very quickly and, and you couldn't get these cascading outages like you got in, in, in 2003 in the Northeast where a tree touched a line in Ohio and you had New York out for a week. You, know? uh, you, you could stop that kind of thing. You know, it is true that the bad guys will keep innovating, but I also think our own innovation will continue in a positive sense. And so there will be new technologies that will be deployed which will create new vulnerabilities because these new technologies enable us to do more. And so I don't think everything's been invented on either side. I don't think we've, in, clearly we haven't come to the frontier of invention in terms of what makes our lives more, gives us more possibility in our lives. And at the same time, we haven't therefore invented the solutions to the vulnerabilities that those new technologies may create. 
it's a constantly moving goal line. And so my sense from meeting with our uh, brilliant scientists and technologists in many of the labs that we've talked about is that they are, on, they, are, they are pushing out the boundaries of knowledge every day, and they don't have all the solutions. They have some, and we're testing, trying to de develop and deploy them, but there's lots to be invented to keep pace with the innovation in our economy and in economies around the world. Great. Thank you. Um, next question. Thank you. My question has to do with this particular session is focused on the oh, grid. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you introduce oh, yourself? Oh, I'm John Fox from Stanford and Slack. So this session is really focused on the grid and vulnerabilities. But if you think one step larger in organization, I'm curious how you think the level of preparation or level of response for the grid compares to attack on the banking system or shutting down credit card processing or air traffic control or transportation systems or breaking in a, you know, control systems for pipelines or hydroelectric dams or whatever. I mean, the, the common aspects of the communications or the interconnectedness gives you many paths to do stuff like this. So I'm just curious, your perception is the grid worse, better, about the same? Is it better to approach these problems broadly? on these system by system cases, I'm very curious how you view the larger problems. Liz. There are a number of what we call lifeline sectors of the economy, and certainly you've described <laughs> others that are critically important. The financial sector is a good example. What we, as I think about it and came to appreciate the role that we had to play in the responsibilities that I was asked to assume, Without power, our economy stops functioning. So that's a lifeline sector. The other sectors that make it possible to conduct our business and our lives are interconnected or interdependent with this sector, and we are interdependent with those sectors. And those sectors are also extremely vulnerable and face similar challenges in the need for innovation, the need for investment, aging infrastructure, and the rest. I wouldn't be able to give you a, this is more threatened than that analysis that would be informed with data. Uh, but certainly in working with my colleagues in other agencies, so for example, the Treasury Department we collaborated very closely with on a number of these issues, they certainly felt that they were in, in a situation of significant concern and that they needed to be uh, working aggressively as we were working to make themselves both more resilient and secure. And I'll uh, just um, note, um, and then John, um, that MIT held a series of workshops mm -hmm. in 2015 and 2016 looking at, I think it was four sectors in particular, um, electricity, oil, gas, communications, and finance, um, released a report earlier this year um, with recommendations that did go to the new administration, and it brought together both what are the things we need to think about cross-sectoral, because we are interconnected, and then within each of these sectors, what are the things we need to think about and, and um, uh, future research. So I think what it tells us is that it's not that you can deal with any one sector in isolation. You need to think about the threats specific to that sector, but we also need to think about across our economy and across our different sectors, what to deal with it. John? But I'd say with respect to relative th threats, and again, I don't have the data on the non-electric sectors, the banking sector, uh, and some of the other major sectors of our, our economy, uh, but, but I have the perception, uh, without giving you specifics, um, that the electric sector has many, many fewer vulnerable nodes than these other sectors do, in, in the sense that, that, not many fewer, I probably said that the wrong way, that ultimately the electric sector, because it has many fewer critical nodes, is much more vulnerable than the other sectors, than the banking sector. Uh, is our, much it, more vulnerable. Yeah, is much, much oh. more, the electric sector is much, much more vulnerable than these other sectors because it has um, you only have to take out much fewer critical nodes, and the other the other ones are more distributed. Let's that's the that's the issue. The other ones I have the perception are much more distributed than the electric sector, Just which is much 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 more much more dependent on on fewer 
critical nodes that if we're moved from the system, it would be gone. I'm going to take this up a level to thinking about national defense. One of the reasons this has become more um, exigent for us is that we have lived through decades in which nuclear deterrence defended our nation. Ultimately, the homeland was safe because the nuclear deterrent worked. And the nuclear deterrent still works, and it will defend against nuclear threats, deter and defend. Uh, but what our adversaries have identified is ways to essentially come in under that deterrent and uh, uh, exploit an element of our system that could disable our nation without having to attack us with nuclear weapons. And that can be a state actor, or it could conceivably be a terrorist group. That w and in the case of a state actor, some would have a nuclear capability or a conventional capability that would be significant. In the case of a terrorist group, this could be their only means of getting at us. And so we have to think about defense in a new way because of the threats that have emerged since the end of the Cold War and which create vulnerabilities for us that could uh, challenge our security. And that's, that's why I think this question about why does the grid matter, why are we focused on it here, is that it really is a way of, of disabling our nation if you were to be able to attack it on a scale that would uh, prevent power from being distributed to a broad swath of our population. Whoever has the microphone there, um, we're, OK, I think uh, just one minute. I think we had one person there who's just slightly before you. You'll be next. <coughs> Thank you. what, five milliseconds before me, or what? Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> Thank you. Excellent session. Um, Ami Amarnath uh, Epri. Um, you know, as a follow-up to the previous question, um, can the panel address uh, anything about one specific threat that's been going on, that is uh, EMP, electromagnetic yeah. pulse? That actually, I should have included that in the description of the full spectrum of threats that I began with, so thank you for bringing it up. This is a low probability but very high, high consequence yeah. threat. And there's been enormous congressional interest in electromagnetic pulse effects on the grid. And uh, we, uh, there is substantial work underway in a number of our national labs on <coughs> this threat and what its consequences would be. Uh, and we know that some of our adversaries have considered this as a way of, of um, affecting our our nation, and so while it's not something that is likely to be utilized in a scenario short of, frankly, all-out war on our nation, it is something that we have to consider as one of those extreme scenarios that we could conceivably have to uh, recover from. Yes. Um. Yeah, he, We're standing he, he, in between he, he, he you and lunch. Okay, say. we have our little <laughs> monitor up here so you can override it. <laughs> I, uh, uh, my name is Paul Grant, and I really am at a loss to describe myself at this stage of my life. I think aging physicist would be uh, most appropriate. Um, in the months following 9-11, I was a science fellow at EPRI, and we undertook a red team exercise you guys know what a red team is? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, I, I thought so. And we went through almost all the scenarios that you talked about today, uh, including the one, uh, and I don't know how, many, how much detail I can go into, or I should go into, but you know what happened at Metcalf? We, we predicted that. And in fact, you have to remember, Metcalf was really uh, uh, a stealing of the fiber optics cables and the shooting of the transformer was more like an act of vandalism, but we came up with exactly those kinds of scenarios. And uh, we, we ran this red team exercise. We reported it to our members, and I think we also notified DOE. 
but I don't know what happened to it after that. Okay. Um, I remember... I'm, uh, I'm sorry, since we've gotten the high sign from Jim, um, is, if we could ask you just to focus on, was there a question? Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe we should talk, because I, I don't know how much I can really say, uh, given a security clearance I have. But okay. everything you're talking about is not new, including EMP. In fact, the founder of EPRI, in, in I think it was 1949, they actually ran, ran a, a model of EMP uh, on, the, on, mm -hmm. on the grid. Mm -hmm. At the time, it wasn't that big a deal. Mm -hmm. So my question is, can you give me some scientific studies today? I uh, actually have the algebra of what happens to, say, a, a 10 megaton bomb exploded at, a, at an altitude, say, of uh, 150,000 feet. Absent any response that may be something we should take offline. Yeah, well, no I'll idea. just say this. Um, <clears throat> I was actually in a conversation about this in the last couple months, and uh, there, there is an analysis of exactly what you described, as well as other scenarios of EMPs, and um, we do know how the technology reacts to it. So um, and, I'll offer and, that. And I'll add that in the partnership I described with industry, the Electricity Sector Coordinating Council working with us and with EPRI, uh, work has been done more recently on assessing this is a, this is EMP impacts. That's what yeah. you saw. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and, yeah. okay. and I would just uh -huh. wrap up and say, I don't need the megaton bomb. I need nine guys in three pickup trucks. And I take out the whole Western grid. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, let me um, join in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you.